Amen. I want to welcome you to Bible study this new ministerial year. I pray that you will have something to rejoice over. And the workings of the Holy Spirit in your life will be more pronounced. You will be a beneficiary of the instructions from the scriptures. Your life will be molded by the truth. You will not just hear the teachings, you will practice them. And your life will not remain the same. Let us pray. Father, tonight we are grateful. We we'll give you all the glory again for your faithfulness, your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for starting the journey of Bible study in this new year with us. And thank you for the things you have ordained for us. As we fellowship together around your word, as we fellowship together around the truth, we are grateful. Great Holy Spirit, we give you all the glory. Lord, we commit the Bible study this year to your hand that you will take all the control and take all the preeminence and do the things that only you can do and open the scriptures to us and teach us the truth from the word of God and remind us the things that we are forgetting and teach us even new things in the name of Jesus. I ask that the anointing for consistency will rest upon every one of us. That everyone will take a decision to be consistent in the Bible study this year. That your place will not be empty. Your place will not be given to another person. You will be a partaker of the blessings of knowing God. A partaker of the blessing of knowing the truth. And a partaker of the blessing of living by the truth. In the name of Jesus. Let your word be anointed in these Bible studies. And do the things that only you can do. Great Holy Spirit be free in all our Bible studies. Reach out to men. Reach out to women. Reach out to everyone. Online, on ground. Use the instrument of the teaching of the word of God to move our lives to what you have ordained for it to be. In the name of Jesus, we receive the light from heaven, the light from the scripture, the light from the truth. That every aspect of human life, every aspect of our physical life on the earth will be reshaped according to your will. We will not live a lesser life. We will live the life that the word of God has ordained for us. In the name of Jesus. Let your word begin to break every negative spirit, negative yokes, and other mindset that is contrary to the purpose of God. Let the word of God begin to break every ancestral hold and every carnality and Adamic nature that we begin to know you more and we begin to reflect your glory upon the earth. Thank you, Father. In this year Bible study, Holy Spirit, draw men to the Father. From far and near, Lord, draw men to the Father. Highlight these meetings for people that you have ordained to be part of it. Online, on ground. Do the things that only you can do. We well, thank you, Father. Blessed, blessed, blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let's be seated. Tonight, we are picking up from Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. If you have been following, you will discover that we were able to round up with Matthew chapter 6 last year and the remaining part which is the last verse of chapter 6 we rounded it off during the covenant month especially in our Sunday service. How many of you remember? All right. 
So that was done intentionally so that we could just go straight to a new chapter entirely as we begin the journey of this year. And I believe the Lord is going to help us and the Lord is going to bless us in the name of Jesus. So uh, when we started the journey of the Sermon on the Mount, I told you that the Sermon on the Mount is in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7. So there are three, three chapters that Jesus Christ, that all the Sermon, all the teachings of Jesus Christ on the Mount actually covers and uh, by the grace of God in the last few years we have been able to go through the whole of chapter 5 and then the whole of chapter 6 so we are stepping into the last lap this evening and I want to talk about Christ command against uncharitable judgment Christ command against uncharitable judgment. Christ command against uncharitable judgment. And I'm going to read two scriptures. The first one is Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2. And then the second one is John chapter 7, verse 24. John chapter 7, verse 24. And I'd like every one of us to open the scriptures together and take particular note of these two scriptures. So let's take the first one, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. I want you to follow me very, very closely because I'm going to ask you a question from the passage I want to read now. And if you don't follow me well, you won't be able to answer the question. Is that okay? So it's important you follow. Matthew chapter 7, I read verses 1 and 2. Judge not that ye be not judged. Verse 2, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye made, it shall be measured to you again. The message of that scripture is very clear, isn't it? Don't judge, isn't it? Because the same judgment you judge another person, is the judgment that is going to be given to you. The same measure you met out to another person is the measure that you are going to be given back. Okay? So that message is clear. So let's look at the second scripture. John chapter 7. I'm reading verse 24. John chapter 7. I'm reading verse 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That one is also very clear, isn't it? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now, if you look at these two scriptures, uh, it looks to me what do you observe? Do you observe anything in the two scriptures? What do you observe? Hello, somebody? What do you observe? Now, we should give righteous judgment. Okay. Now, looking critically at the two scriptures that I've read, it appears that there is a contradiction. Now, I didn't say there is a contradiction. I said, it appears. Is that okay? 
it appears because most people that read the Bible always want to, I mean, especially those that do not really understand the word of God, they always claim that there are some sections of the Bible that contradict the other. And I'm sure you have heard that before. That some people will say that the Bible is contradictory. That there is some passage that is also contradictory another passage. Especially there is a particular religious set of people that I don't want to mention their name. That that is their accusation. And that accusation always confuses people that are unsuspecting believers or believers that are not strong in the word of God. So when we pick these two scriptures to such people, they want to agree, argue that there is a contradiction. Because one say, don't judge. The other one say, you can judge. But judge righteous judgment. So, so a non-suspecting believer, the question is, which one are we going to actually believe now? Did you hear what I just said now? One seems to forbid judging others. The other seems to encourage it. Now, it looks, I didn't say, it appears. Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 seems to forbid judging another person. Is that not what it says? And then John 7.24 seems to encourage that well you can judge but make sure that your judgment is a righteous judgment. So if you don't really understand the scripture very well it will be difficult for you to resolve these two. But let me say clearly that don't have the mindset that scriptures are contradictory. Don't ever have that mindset. There is no part of the scripture that is contradictory to another part. The Bible written by men under the full influence of the Holy Spirit is in perfect harmony. Is that okay? In fact, the Bible was written over a period of 1,600 years by different people with different color with different background a different generation but there is complete harmony why because the holy spirit is in complete supervision of the mind and the physical faculty of all the men that god used to write the bible is that okay that is one proof to tell you that it was the holy it was written by the holy spirit the Bible is the dictation of the Holy Spirit. The only thing that man did was to write. Man had no natural contribution to its content. It was the Holy Spirit that was dictating, that was dictating, that was supervising. And even though different men were used by God to write the scripture, it was not written by, this, by different Holy Spirit. So you don't expect it to contradict. Assuming the men that wrote the Bible were left to themselves to write what they feel should be written, you are going to see very obvious contradictions. Because the one that wrote in one generation is not going to agree with the one that is writing in another generation. But because these different men are under the full control of the same Holy Spirit. Every part of scripture is in harmony with another part. The Old Testament does not contradict the New Testament. Rather, the New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. Are you following what I'm saying now? Then the New Testament continues the Old Testament. There is the New Testament improves the Old Testament. There is no contradiction whatsoever. There is no part of the scripture that contradicts. So I want you to settle that in your mind. Praise God. So it's very clear there is no contradiction. One of the reasons why 
there are no contradiction, especially looking at these two scriptures, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, and John chapter 7, verse 24, is that these two scriptures were direct statements from Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? If you have a red letter Bible edition like I have, you will discover that Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 was printed in red letter. Then John chapter 7 verse 24 was printed in red letter. Red letter shows that those were the direct statements of Jesus. Is that okay? Did you get that now? So both Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 and John chapter 7 verse 24 were direct statements of Jesus. So they couldn't have contradicted each other. Jesus could not have approbated in Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 and reprobated in John chapter 7 verse 24. Is that okay? He couldn't have said something in Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 and then get to John 7 24 and say he didn't say it again. So since the two scriptures are direct statement from the mouth of Jesus. He couldn't have contradicted. Is that okay? There is no contradiction. There is no ambiguity. Now, if there is no contradiction, how then can we harmonize the two? How then can we explain the two? Because on the surface, Matthew chapter 7 is telling us, don't judge. On the surface, John chapter 7 verse 24 is telling us, you can judge, but judge the righteous judgment. So, it becomes a bit challenging for people who do not really understand what the scripture is saying to agree that they do not contradict. But, they do not contradict. The reason is because in Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2, Christ is condemning uncharitable judgment. Christ is condemning unlawful judgment. Christ is condemning unrighteous judgment. That's what you have in Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge ye shall be judged and with what measure ye met it shall be measured to you again. Now very shortly we will still read up to verse 5 or verse 6 you will have a full understanding that Christ was condemning uncharitable judgment. Somebody say uncharitable judgment is the same thing as unlawful judgment. Is the same thing as unrighteous judgment. What is uncharitable judgment? What is unlawful judgment? What is unrighteous judgment? It is a judgment that is not based on love, a judgment that is not based on truth, a judgment that is not based on righteousness. Did you hear that? A judgment that is not based on love. A judgment that is not based on truth. A judgment that is not based on righteousness. That kind of judgment is called uncharitable judgment, unlawful judgment, unrighteous judgment. That is what Christ is condemning in Matthew chapter 7. How many of you have been a recipient of a judgment that is not based on love? How many of you have been a victim of a judgment that is not based on truth? How many of you have been a victim of a judgment that is not based on righteousness? How many of you have experienced people bringing a conclusion on your matter and that, that their conclusion is not based on truth? Are you getting what I'm saying now? Now, if you have ever experienced it, you will understand how painful it can be. For somebody to judge you uncharitably, for somebody to judge you unlawfully, for somebody to judge you unrighteously. 
uncharitable judgment is the conclusion that is reached that is not based on love. The conclusion that is reached that is not based on the truth. The conclusion that is reached that is not based on righteousness. When people conclude that you are an evil person and that their conclusion is not based on the truth, sometimes based on hearsay, sometimes based on gossip, not based on the truth, not based on righteousness, not based on love. That is uncharitable judgment. That is what Jesus Christ was condemning. That's why he said, don't judge another person uncharitably. Don't judge another person unlawfully. Don't judge another person unrighteously. Is that okay? But in John chapter 7 verse 24, Christ was encouraging unbiased judgment. Christ was encouraging unbiased judgment. When a judgment is unbiased, it is a judgment that is based on love. It is a judgment that is based on truth. It is a judgment that is based on justice. Did you get that now? When a judgment is unbiased, it is a judgment that is based on truth. It is a judgment that is based on love. It is a judgment that is based on fact. It is a judgment that is based on justice. Did you get it now? So in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 and 2, Christ was condemning on charitable judgment. In John chapter 7 verse 24, Christ was encouraging unbiased judgment. Do you see the harmony now? Are they contradictory? Talk to me. Are they harmonious? Are they in harmony? Good. That tells you that there is no contradictions in the word of God. That's why it is inspired. That's why it is unique. Praise God. Having said that, let me keep my focus tonight basically on Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2. And I want to write, I want to write this down. Understanding unrighteous and unlawful judgment. Understanding unrighteous and unlawful judgment. That's our focus for tonight. Understanding it. Because it's important for us to understand it. If you don't understand what is unlawful judgment, what's unrighteous judgment, you'll get confused. So let me read again Matthew chapter 7. I'll read verse 1 now. Judge not that ye be not judged. Judge not is the command of Jesus Christ to every believer. However, lack of understanding of what Christ really means will prevent genuine obedience. We will not be able to obey that command until we understand what exactly Christ really means. This is because many people out of ignorance have casually and carelessly quoted Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 as a cover up for their evil deed especially when they are confronted. Hello somebody. Many many people out of ignorance have casually and carelessly quoted Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 as a cover up for their evil deed a cover up for their sin a cover up for their unrighteous lifestyle anytime they are confronted. How many of you have seen people before when they are doing what is wrong and you confront them and they say, hey, you are judging me. The Bible says, judge not so that you will not be judged. Such people don't understand what the scripture say. They just want to keep you short. They don't want you to say anything. They don't want you to correct them. They hate instruction they hate correction. So in order for you to keep quiet, they say, the Bible says, don't judge. Don't judge me. Judge not. So that you will not be judged. These people, they insist in error that Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 
is advocating absolute liberty without restraint. That's their understanding, which is erroneous. They say, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2 is talking about absolute liberty without restraint. Absolute liberty means we can do anything we like. After all, the Bible says nobody can judge us. Judge not. So I can do what I like. Either it is right or wrong. You, you can't judge me. You can't criticize me. You can't condemn me. Because the Bible says, judge not. They say that's what the scripture means. That we, are, we, are, we have absolute freedom without restraint. A freedom that is having no restraint is a freedom that will kill you. You must never, never have that kind of freedom in your life. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Anybody that read the scripture very well and understand the scripture very well, we know that it is not in the nature and the nature of the scripture to have absolute freedom without restraint. Is that okay? If you have been reading the Bible very well, you will know that's not the Bible. Absolute freedom without control. Absolute freedom without restraint. I can do what I like. That is not the spirit and the letter of the Bible. Absolute freedom without restraint is a freedom that kills people. It's a freedom that destroys people. And we live in the last days that a lot of people today do not like the truth because the works of their hands are evil and they don't want correction. So they, they hold on to this place. So any, 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 any attempt to correct them, they will accuse you. Don't judge me. You are not my God. You can't judge me. The, gate, the key to the gate of heaven is not in your hand. You are not the one that can judge me. Leave me alone. The Bible says, judge not, so that you will not be judged. Praise God. Absolute freedom without restraint is a freedom that will kill. I ask you a question. Let me ask you again. Now, somebody just bought a brand new vehicle and gave it to you as a gift. Brand new. Brand new. And he said, but there is only one problem with that vehicle. It doesn't have any brake system. Will you accept that gift? Will you accept that as a seed? Of course, you know that's a gift that will kill. It, no matter how new the car is, if it doesn't have a braking system, it's no longer a car, it's a coffin. Did you hear what I say now? Nobody can give you that kind of gift and you accept it talk less of uh, appreciating it. In fact, you will agree that that person wants to kill you. Eh, is that what you want to do? Ah, Your secret has been exposed. Giving me a car that has no brake system. That's exactly what it means when people believe that, well, nobody can talk to me. I have absolute freedom without restraint. This kind of people they resent correction. They resent caution. They resent rebuke. And any form of accountability. They resent correction. They resent caution. They resent rebuke. And any form of accountability. When you are bringing correction, they say you are judging me. When you are sending caution, they say you are judging me. After all, we are free in Christ. Their freedom is a freedom without control. In fact, there are some group of people that call themselves free nation in Christ. And they, they, have, they have gone to a higher level of saying grace cover everything we do. And when you are trying to bring them to order, they say no, you don't have the right to judge us. You know, these are the generation of hyper grace preachers. Hyper grace, God. grace cover, grace cover everything. Nobody can judge us. You have an army of such rebellious people on our Facebook today. That's why I told you you can't learn the Bible from Facebook preachers. 
Because 90% of them are lawless people that don't like control, that don't like correction, that believes that every calling, every every attempt to call people to a sense of responsibility and accountability is judgment. Praise God. Are you getting what I'm saying now? These people, they believe that judge not should be absolutely and universally practiced. They hope for a civilization where there will be liberty for everybody to do as they please without judging anyone. Beloved, how did we come to man and man sleeping together? Gay. How do we come to gay? It is this mentality that we are free to do anything and nobody can correct us. In the so-called developed nation today, we have gay pastors. We have gay bishops. We have gay churches. Man and man, woman and woman. In fact, if you look at some gay people, anyhow, they can sue you. They say you are discriminating. Do you understand what I'm saying now? Now, if a man and a man want to get married and a pastor insists, no, I'm not going to do it. We have record of in cases that such pastors have been sued to court in this so-called advanced country. Are you hearing me now? Advancing in technology but declining spiritually. Advancing in technology but retrogressing spiritually and morally. They have charged pastors to court because they refused to wed man and man. Did you get what I'm saying now? Any attempt to look at them somehow or to look at them as strange, they say you are discriminating. They say you are discriminating. That they are free to do what they like. This is the mindset of such people. That there must be a civilization that everybody is free to do what they like without anybody judging anybody. They say, after all, Matthew chapter 7 says, judge not, so that thou shall not be judged. Of course, you know that's not what the Bible is saying. Of course, you know that's not what Jesus is saying. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? But many people will use a, a twisted interpretation of scripture to, ju to justify unrighteousness and lawlessness. Let me give this counsel as a pastor. Any environment that allows you to do anything you like without restraint is an environment that will kill your future. Don't ever embrace that system. When you can do what you like, you can say what you like, you can, you can talk what you like, you can do whatever you like without any restraint, no control, no correction, no accountability. That's a system that will kill your future. Don't ever embrace that system. The devil is fast expect, I mean, establishing such system in most of churches today in the body of Christ. Human nature has a rebellious attitude to the truth. Human nature has a rebellious attitude to correction. Human nature has a rebellious attitude to caution and to control. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Praise God. So people today are looking for a church where they will be free to do what they like. They come in at any time. They go when they like. If they like when the service is going on, they can sleep. If they like when the service is going on, they can talk. They can take their phone call. They can live their life the way they like. And they are looking for a pastor that will not have problems with that. That's a church that is raised by the devil to destroy your life. But when you are in, in a system that demands accountability, that's a system that is raised to build your future. When you are in an environment that you know you cannot try nonsense, you are always conscious not to do anything that is wrong because you know it will not be allowed. 
That's a system that will help your future. That's a place you must embrace. That's a church you must settle down. That's a pastor you must like. Don't hate people that are correcting you. Don't take correction for judgment. Don't take caution for judgment. The devil will try to deceive people. They say it's because they hate you. That's why they are... No, 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 no. Now, it's the duty of the devil to try to kill you. But it's your own duty to say, no way. I will not allow you. Did you get what I'm saying now? Praise God. So when you are in a system that is promoting accountability, correction, caution, rebuke, don't hate that system. Amen. Now, these people that believe that Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 is just saying that you can do whatever you like. Nobody should judge you. Nobody should correct you. Nobody should rebuke you. They have problems. The, the problem of such interpreters. Those that are advocating absolute liberty without restraint. They have three major problems. Number one, they forget that God is the great judge. That's the first problem they have. They forget that God is the great judge. Did you get that? They forget that the Bible says God is the great judge. If they know that God is the great judge, they won't say, well, the Bible is saying that Nobody should judge anybody. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. I, I want you to bring it up for me. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. Look at what the Bible says here. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. And to who? To who? Talk to me. To God. The what? The judge of how many? Of all. I want you to underline your Bible. And to God, the judge of all. So if God is the judge of all, then Matthew chapter 7 couldn't have meant that you are free to do what you like without any restraint. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? Hello? Hello? If God is the judge of all, then Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 couldn't have said that you are free to do anything. Nobody should judge you. Hello? Hello? So those people that believe that Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 says, judge not and that nobody should judge anybody, nobody should correct anybody, nobody should call anybody to order, everybody is free to do what they like, that that is what Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 means. They forget that God himself is the what? Is the judge of all. If God is the judge of all, Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 couldn't have meant that everybody is free to do anything without anybody judging anybody. So that's the first problem they have. <clears throat> Number two, those that are wrongly misinterpreting Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 they forget that Christ is the judge of the living and the dead. They forget that Christ is the judge of the living and the dead. They forget that Christ is the judge of the living and the dead. Which means that whatever the living are, are doing, whatever the dead people have done, Christ will bring them to judgment. They forget that. That's why they thought that Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 gives us the opportunity to do whatever we like that we have absolute freedom without restraint. They forgot that Christ himself is the judge of the living and the dead. Let's see Acts chapter 10 from verse 40 to 42. Acts chapter 10 
from verse 40 to 42. Look at this scripture. The Bible says, Him God raised up the third day. Who is that place talking about? Are you with me? Because Jesus Christ is the only person that God raised up the third day. And showed him openly. Verse 1, verse 41. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Verse 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be what? The judge of quick and dead. The word quick there means living. Of course, you remember in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 when the Bible said the word of God is quick and powerful. And the modern translation said the word of God is living and active. So quick there means living. So Christ is ordained of God to be the judge of the living and the dead. So there is no room for absolute freedom without restraint. Everything that everybody is doing will be brought to judgment. So Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 is not talking about you are free to do whatever you like. No, 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 no. Those that believe that that's what he says, they forgot that even if men don't correct you now, <laughs> Christ will judge the living and the dead. Number three, they forgot that Christians have responsibilities to judge between the brethren. That we Christians, we have responsibility to judge among ourselves. So those that are misinterpreting Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 to mean that nobody can judge anybody so everybody is free to do what they like. They forgot that Christians have responsibility to judge the brethren. Did you get what I'm saying now? In fact, the Bible says it is ridiculous for us if we have issues among ourselves and we cannot judge it and we go to appear before the court of law headed by unrighteous people. In fact, it got to a place the Bible says, shame on you that those of you that are going to judge the angel can't you judge little, little issues? Hello, somebody? So if Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 actually means that nobody can correct anybody, everybody is free to do what they like, the Bible will not say that Christians can judge themselves. Did you get that now? Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I want us to read from verse 1 to verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 from verse 1 to verse 5. Verse 1. There any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Did you see that? Have you exhausted all the, all the justice mechanisms among the brethren? Why should you have issues among yourself and off you go to court to appear before unbelievers? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? Who are the saints? Those of us who are born again. Those of us who are redeemed in the blood of Jesus. Don't you know we are going to judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Hello somebody. You know all those people that are worshipping angels, I pity them. When they say only Michael, somebody say me more. And then somebody bow down to an angel. Those are people that are blinded to their redemptive right. Because if you know that you are going to judge them, you will be worshipping them. Anyway, that's not my focus. My focus is that the Bible says we are going to judge the angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? Verse 4. 
if then ye have judgment of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. If you are going to judge, if you are going to judge the angels, you are going to judge the world. Can't you judge little, little matters? Can't you? Can't you? Hello? Now, if Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 is saying, don't judge at all, don't judge at all, and let everybody be free to do what they like, will the Bible be saying that Christians have responsibility to judge among themselves? Verse 5, he said, I speak to your shame. In fact, there is a translation of the Bible that says, shame on you. Praise God. <laughs> it's a shame on you. The meaning for shame on you is that you that you are going to judge the world. You that you will join Jesus Christ to judge the angel. You can't judge little, little things among yourself. Why did we have to go to that? We have to go to that to explain to you that Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 does not mean that everybody is free to do what they like does not give you the right to say that every correction is judgment. That every caution, every rebuke is somebody's judging you. No. Because if it means that you can do what you like and nobody can talk, it shows that the Bible wouldn't have said that Christians have responsibility to judge among themselves. Did you get it up to that point? Hello, I can't hear you. Okay, there are two things that are very critical for me tonight before we pray. And then it will be easier for us to pick up next week from that. Number one, what is Christ saying in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 and 2? What is he saying? So that's the first thing I'm going to share. Then number two, what is Christ not saying? Well, let me start with what is Christ not saying? What is Christ not saying? Because the, the road to proper interpretation of scripture is to say what the scripture says. And not to say what the scripture did not say. Did you get that now? The road to proper interpretation of the Bible is to always say what the Bible says. And not to say what the Bible didn't say. So the first thing I'm going to do is that. In Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2. What is Christ not saying? Did you get that? And then I will talk. What exactly is Christ saying? And then that will help us to round off tonight. So let me start with this. What is Christ not saying? So that. You don't fall for what Christ is not saying. In Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2. Jesus Christ is not saying four things. And don't ever allow anybody to make you say what Jesus Christ is not saying. Is that okay? Jesus Christ is not saying four things. So don't let anybody make you to say or to believe what Christ is not saying. Number one, Jesus Christ is not saying that we must never see, evaluate, and correct any wrong thing that others do. Jesus Christ is not saying that we must never see, evaluate, and correct any wrong things that others do. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying whatever any wrong thing that anybody is doing, don't see it, don't evaluate it, don't correct it, just leave them. That's not what Jesus is saying. Is that okay? That's not what Jesus is saying. That don't see it all. Whatever anybody is doing, even if it is wrong, even if it is unrighteous, don't see it. Pretend as if you don't see. It. Don't evaluate it. Don't correct anybody, even though they are doing what is wrong. That's not what Jesus Christ is saying. Is that okay? 
And don't let anybody shut you up by saying, the Bible says, judge not. <laughs> don't judge me. Don't judge me. You are not in the right place to judge me. Don't let anybody <laughs> shut you up. Because that's not what Jesus is saying. Number two. Jesus Christ is not saying that we should not hold people to any righteous standard of behavior. Jesus Christ is not saying that we should not hold people to any righteous standard of behavior. That's not what Jesus is saying. He wasn't saying that let everybody behave the way they like. Don't hold anybody to any righteous standard of behavior. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. Is that okay? That's not what Jesus is saying. Number three. Jesus Christ is not saying that we should be indulgent and tolerant accepting whatever anyone does as right. That's not what he's saying. Jesus Christ is never saying, he's not saying we should be indulgent, we should be tolerant, accepting anything that anyone does as right. No, 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 no. That's not what Jesus is saying. There are people today that in, they are accused they accuse their church that our church is not tolerant at all. Uh -uh, they are not tolerant. They have to, they will, they will talk, they will talk, they will talk. Jesus is not saying we should, we should be tolerant of unrighteousness. Jesus is not saying we should be indulgent. Jesus is not saying that we should accept whatever anyone does as right. So that people will not accuse us of judging them. That's not what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Number 4. Jesus is not saying that we should cover up sin and wrongdoing. Leaving everyone to his own conscience and never correcting anyone. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's never saying that just cover up Cover up sin. Cover up unrighteousness. Don't talk about it. Oh. Leave everybody to their conscience. Don't correct anybody. Oh. That's not what Jesus is saying. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? If we have to leave everybody to their own conscience. Some people have lost that conscience. Don't you know? Hello? That it is correction that called the conscience of people back. Do you think it's everybody that still have their conscience intact? Some people have lost it. So Jesus is not saying cover up sin. Cover up wrongdoing. So that they won't accuse you of judging them. So that they won't say you are criticizing them. Cover up. Leave them to their conscience. Don't correct anybody. That's not what Jesus is saying. Did you get that, beloved? Praise God. How many of you are with me tonight? That's not what Jesus is saying. Capital no. That's not what Jesus is saying. Now how do we know that that's not what Jesus is saying? Because in the same chapter he said some other things that made us to know that that was not he said some other things that made us to know that he's not saying that we should not correct he's not saying that we should not hold people up to a righteous standard of behavior he said some other thing in that same chapter that made us believe that it's not saying that we should cover up sin so that people doesn't think that we are judging them that we should just let everybody be held accountable to their conscience look at verse 5 
the same Matthew chapter 7. Verse 5. The Bible said, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thy own eye. You get that? And then shall thou see clearly to do what? Talk to me. To do what? To cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Now, did he say we should not judge at all? Did he say we should not correct at all? He's simply saying, look, you that you want to correct, you must be qualified to correct. Did you get what I'm saying now? You must first of all remove the beam in your own eyes so that you can see clearly to cast out the moat in your brother's eyes. Does that mean don't correct at all? No. It's simply saying you who need help should not try to help another person. Help yourself first. <laughs> Did you get what I'm saying now? You who want to correct, you should not be you should not be found wanting in the same thing you want to correct another person. In the same chapter. Praise God. So he didn't say we shouldn't judge at all. He's only saying, look, you just have to be qualified. You have to be morally qualified to point out what other person is doing by making sure that you are not doing the same thing. Is that okay? Praise God. Look at verse 6. The same Matthew chapter 7 verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. How do you know that somebody is a dog? It means you have an opinion of their character. Yes or no? How do you classify some people as dog? Some people as pig? After all, it's not my word. It's the Bible. Let's finish it. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your peers before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again around you. To obey this command of Christ, it is necessary to observe and form an opinion about the character of other people. So Jesus wouldn't have said what he said in verse 6 if, he, if what he meant in verse 1 is that don't correct anybody, just leave everybody to their conscience. Don't hold anybody to a righteous standard of behavior. Just allow people to do that. Are you following? Now, there is this Bible study because you allow the Bible to defend the Bible. You allow the truth to defend the truth. The scripture can defend the scripture. Now, give me from verse 15. The same Matthew chapter 7 from verse 15. <clears throat> it says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Give me verse 20. Verse 20. Wherefore? Can you read with me? One, two, go. Wherefore? By their fruit ye shall know them. Now, if we do not examine them and judge them and judge the fruit of the false prophet, how can we know that their character is not good? Hello, somebody. How can we know them as ravening wolves inside? So, you see three instances in the same chapter That is allowing us to hold people accountable. So Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Does not talk about absolute freedom without restraint. Praise God. Because until we pull down the wrong theology of people that believe that whenever you want to correct them. You are judging them. They will always be using Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 to keep you short. And if all of us keep short, many people will go to hell. 
In fact, there are some people that are doing what they, they, what they are doing is wrong, but they themselves don't know it is wrong. It is when somebody holds up to correct them that they will realize what they are doing is what? Is wrong. How many of you have benefited from correction before? Sure? Good. You see, so if we don't pull down that wrong, that wrong interpretation that some people say, eh, don't judge me, don't judge me, leave me alone. No. After all, the Bible says, judge not, so that you not be judged. If we don't explain it very well, we will have a rowdy system, an unrighteous church that many people will go to church right, will go to hell right from church. And the people that are supposed to talk and call them to order will be afraid of not being seen as a judge. But of course you know that's not what the Bible is saying. I want you to give me Luke chapter 17 verses 3 and 4. Luke chapter 17 verses 3 and 4. Now I'd like you to look at this. Look at the screen and let's look at this scripture. <clears throat> Are you there? Are you there? Okay. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee. What are you supposed to do? Who is talking there? It's Jesus Christ. Rebuke him. Did he say, keep quiet? Did he say, don't judge him? Did he say, leave him to his conscience? <laughs> what did he say? Open up. Rebuke him. And if he repents, what? Forgive him. Praise God. <laughs> so Matthew 7 1 wouldn't have meant don't judge anybody. Leave everybody to do what they like. But he's simply saying, You that want to judge, make sure you are not doing the same thing. Did you get that now? Praise God. He's simply saying, let your judgment be based on truth, on love, on righteousness. So let me look at what is Jesus Christ saying. I've told you four things that he's not saying. So I'll tell you six things that he is saying. What exactly is he saying? In Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2. What is Christ saying? I will bring it like statements that will help us to understand the scriptures. Number one, Jesus Christ is saying, don't exalt yourself and despise others. Did you get that? Don't exalt yourself and despise others. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't exalt yourself and despise others. That will be uncharitable. That will be unlawful. That will be unrighteous. Luke chapter 18 verse 9. Luke chapter 18 verse 9 and he spake this parable unto certain which what? Trusted in themselves that they were righteous and what? And despised others. You do hear? How many of you remember the two people that went to the temple to pray? I want to believe that if you read that Luke chapter 18 down, you will see the story there. One was a Pharisee. One was a publican. And the Pharisee came up with the credentials that he parades. His own credentials of right, self-righteousness. I fast twice a week. I pay my tithe. I do this. I do that. I am not even like this one. 
But when the publican came, he didn't even look up to him. He fell down before the Lord and said, have mercy on me and sin. And Jesus said, that publican went back home more justified than the Pharisee. It is a Pharisaic attitude. When you exalt yourself, and you despise other people. That's the meaning of judge not so that you will not be judged. Jesus is saying, don't exalt yourself and despise other people. Is that okay? Praise God. You know there are some people that will criticize you in a manner that make them to exalt themselves and put you down. That's what the Bible means when it says, judge not. So that you will not be judged. Number two. Jesus Christ is saying, don't judge others with a holier than thou attitude. Don't judge others with a holier than thou attitude. Is that okay? That's what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. When he says, judge not so that you will not be judged. You want to correct people? You want to cancel people? Don't correct, counsel, criticize, or judge others with a what? Holier than thou attitude. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 3 to 5. You will see the attitude of people that people that have a holier than thou attitude. I read from verse 3. The Bible says, A people that provoke me to anger continually to my face. That's those people that have this holier than thou attitude. That's how God is looking at them. The sacrifice it in the gardens and burnt incense upon altars of brick, which will remain among the graves and lodge in the monument, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessel. Look at verse 5. Which say, stand by them thyself, come not near me. For I am what? For I am holier than thou. These are a what? A smoke in my nose. How many of you know how smoke feels in the nose? God says anybody that has that attitude, I'm holier than thou attitude, is like a smoke in his nose. A fire that burneth all the day. So Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 is simply saying, don't judge others with a holier than thou attitude. Don't correct other people as somebody that has not received mercy yourself. Don't criticize other people as somebody that has not received mercy yourself. Don't come with the posture of I am better than you. I am holier than you. That is what Jesus is saying when he says, judge not so that you will not be judged. Number three, what is Jesus saying? Jesus Christ is saying, don't condemn or criticize others on minute, insignificant, unimportant things. Why you excuse terrible, soul-threatening sin in yourself? Don't condemn or criticize others on minute, insignificant, unimportant things while you excuse terrible, soul-threatening sin in yourself. Some people, when they see some 
minute things in the life of other person. Unimportant and insignificant thing. They will condemn it. They will criticize it. But they themselves, they are excusing terrible sins in their life. They are excusing soul-threatening sin in their life. They won't deal with that one. It is the minute, unimportant, insignificant things in the life of others that they will, they will keep criticizing. Did you get what I'm saying now? Well, people like that, that their own case is even worse. They have not dealt with that, but they'll be the first to criticize and condemn little, little things in the life of other people. That's what Jesus is saying. Help yourself first before you help another person. When you are excusing terrible, soul-threatening sin in your life, you have no right to condemn or criticize little, little things in the life of another person. Did you get that? I said, did you get that? Number four. What is Jesus Christ saying? He's saying, don't set aside the laws of God in your personal conduct and life. And be judging others based upon the many ridiculous law on non-essential and superficial things that you have established for yourself. Some people, they, will, they, they don't live by the law of God. They are not obeying the commandment of God. They set aside the laws of God. But they now judge other people and criticize other people based upon their own ridiculous laws that they have established for themselves. Hello, somebody. That is uncharitable judgment. That's what Christ is warning against. Let me give you an example. How many of you have heard when Jesus was talking to, I mean, I think the Pharisees came to Jesus and they came to accuse the disciple of Jesus. One, they say they were on the Sabbath day. Jesus and the disciples were passing through a plantation of maize. How many of you remember that scripture? And they are hungry. And they are just removing maize and eating it on the Sabbath day. How many of you remember that? <laughs> Praise God. So the Pharisees came to accuse them that your disciples are walking on Sabbath day, they are removing maize from his stand and eating it on the Sabbath day, thereby undermining the tra tradition of elders. At another time, they accused them that they didn't wash their hands before they eat. How many of you remember that? They say, why is your, why is your disciple not washing their hands before they eat? And how many of you remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, why do you undermine the laws of God with the tradition of elders? Why do you undermine the laws of God with your so-called tradition of elders? The Pharisees, scribes, are people who are not living their life by the laws of God, but who have also set apart, who have established ridiculous law referred to as the tradition of elders. And that they are judging people based upon their own self-established ridiculous laws. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Praise God. I hope somebody got something tonight. So Jesus is saying, if you are not living your life by the laws of God, why do you judge other people by your own ridiculous law that you have set for yourself? Because you yourself are not living by the law of God. So don't set aside the laws of God in your personal conduct and life and be judging others based upon the many ridiculous law on non-essentials and superficial things that you have established for yourself. Anybody that didn't wash his hand before eating has not broken any spiritual law. 
he may have broken hygienic law. He will only have running stomach, have diarrhea or cholera. Even if the cholera kills him, that doesn't send him to hell. He would have cut short his life. Hello, somebody. But the Pharisees will say, well, we suspend the law of God. We focus on the law of elders or the tradition of elders. And they are judging people based on that. Do you know that people are like that today? In fact, there are some churches that what they judge people based upon is not, is not, is not the, the standard of the word of God. It is the rule, the law that they have gathered together that in our church. How many of you understand what I'm saying now? Praise God. In our church, nobody can wear lace. In our church. I'm yet to see where that is written in the Bible. So anybody that wear lace in that church, ah, is a sinner. Can you hear what I'm saying now? <laughs> in our church. So their own personal uh, law, ridiculous law that they have put together, they place it above the word of God. Praise God. In our church, nobody must wear a ring. Anybody that wears a ring is going to hell. I have not seen where the Bible said that. The only thing the Bible says is moderation. And more so, let there be inner beauty. You get what I'm saying now? Don't because of the outside beauty now sacrifice the inner beauty. This culture of saying what the Bible didn't say is going to produce more hypocrites in the body of Christ. My first loyalty is to the scripture. And I'm never going to say anything the Bible didn't say. Somebody said, but your wife is not using the earring. It's a personal decision. Based on personal encounter that she had with the Lord at a point in her life. And I understand that encounter. And I'm okay with that. Is somebody hearing me now? I have friends that use it. It doesn't stop me from being their friends. It doesn't stop us from walking together. Praise God. So you must understand that what Jesus is saying. Don't be judging other people when you yourself are not living according to the word of God, but you are now judging other people based on your own preconceived pre ridiculous law. So what they know about this, this church, they don't do this. That church, they don't do this. This church, they don't do this. This church, they don't do this. Most of those things are not in the Bible. They are just personal <laughs> administrative law. For their own benefit and for their own purpose. Praise God. And they are trying to enforce it. The mistake is that they are trying to enforce it as a law. Upon the general body of Christ. So if you see anybody now that is not doing what they what that is doing what they say in your church that you, in our church we don't do this. I say no 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 they are not Christian. We are the Christian. Do you get what I'm saying now? Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Oh wow. Number five. What is Jesus Christ saying? Don't be hypocritical and full of errors and self-deception like the Pharisees. That's what he's saying. Don't be hypocritical and full of errors and self-deception like the Pharisees. Now, 
chapter, if you look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 8. Now, I want us to read verse 8a. And then we just apox it with chapter 7, verse 1. Did you get that? Okay, look at verse, chapter 6, verse 8a. Be not ye therefore like unto them. Who are the them that the Bible is talking about there? The Pharisees and the scribes. How many of you agree with me that the sermon of Jesus of the Mount, most of the content of that sermon condemn the hypocritical attitude of the scribes and the Pharisees. Because the scribes and the Pharisees were the religious leaders in the day of Jesus. And they are not connecting people to God. They are not connecting people to righteousness. They are hypocritical. They are full of pretense. They are full of errors. They are full of self-righteousness. That was why Jesus came to establish the laws of the kingdom. So in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 7, referred to as the sermon of Jesus on the, on the mount is just Jesus' way of establishing the kingdom laws as opposed to the hypocritical laws of the scribes and the Pharisees. Praise God. That's why Jesus said, don't be like them. The Pharisees will be judging other people, but what they are doing is more than what the people they are judging are doing. In fact, when Jesus came to Matthew 23, he came down heavily on the scribes and the Pharisees. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 23. How many of you have read that place before? Matthew chapter 23. Oh, you will know that Jesus came down heavily on, on the scribes and the Pharisees. Whoever is criticizing another person, and you are doing worse things that the other person you are criticizing is doing. What do you call that person? Righteous or hypocritical? Are you hearing me now? So Jesus is saying, don't judge uncharitably. Don't judge unlawfully. Don't judge unrighteously. Don't judge like the Pharisee who are full of errors and self-deception. Amen. So let's look at Matthew chapter 23. I will just take some selected verse because of our time. Verse 1. Then speak Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works. Why? For they say and do not. <laughs> you see? Wow. Oh, Jesus was not talking in private. He was talking publicly. He was saying, you see these Pharisees, this Christ, these people that post around as religious leader. They don't do what they say. Oh. So don't follow them. They criticize others, but they are doing worse. Amen? Look at verse 13. But who want to use scribes and Pharisees? What? Hypocrite. For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourself, neither suffer them that are entering to go in. Verse 14. Who want to use Christ and Pharisees? What did he call them? Hypocrite. For ye devour widows' houses. And for a what? Talk to me now. For a pretense so make what? Long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the great damnation. Amen. Okay. Um. 
Go to verse 25. I'm just trying to select. You can read the whole chapter on your Verse 25. Who unto you, scribes and Pharisees? What? Hypocrite. For ye make clean. What? The outside of the cup and of the platter. But within, they are what? They are full of extortion and excess. Thou what? Blind Pharisee. Cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter. That the outside of them may be clean also. Look at verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He was consistent in calling them what? Hypocrites. For ye are like unto whited sepulchre, which indeed appear what? Beautiful outside, but are within full of dead men's bones and of uncleanness. Praise God. You can read the other ones. So what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 is that don't judge people like the Pharisees do. They are full of pretense. They are full of hypocrisy. What they are doing. They also criticize other people. In fact, some of them are worse than the people they are correcting. Don't be like that. That's the meaning of judge not. So that you will not be judged. Number six. This is the last one. What is he saying? Jesus is saying, judge not according to the appearances, but judge righteous judgment. That sounds like John chapter 7 verse 24. Is that correct? How many of you remember where we started? We started by bringing out two scriptures, isn't it? Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 and John chapter 7 verse 24. What does it now appear to you now? They are not contradictory. But John 7 24 is the right explanation of what Christ is saying in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Do you agree? Do you agree? So what Jesus is saying in Matthew 7 verse 1 is judge not according to the appearance but judge righteous judgment. So John 7 24 is what Christ is saying in Matthew 7 1. Judge righteous judgment. Don't judge your righteousness. Don't judge unlawfully. Don't judge uncharitably. Let me tell you this as we pray. Just listen. Understand this truth. Judging others on seemingly unimportant issues. While you are guilty of great soul damning sin. Shows that you are not motivated by real spiritual concern. And you are not seeking the glory of God. That's the truth. When we are judging other people on little, little things, when our own life is filled with terrible, soul damning sin, it's an indication that. You don't have a real spiritual concern for the people. You have another motive you want to satisfy. And you are not seeking the glory of God. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying now? If I say you should not commit adultery and I'm committing adultery and I'm criticizing you for committing adultery I'm judging you and punishing you for committing adultery and I'm also committing a dot. It only shows that I do not have real spiritual concern for you. And I am not seeking the glory of God. That's the first truth you must establish. It. How can you be condemning what you are doing in, in what you are also doing guilty? 
In fact, some people are worse sinner than the people they are correcting. It shows that they don't have real concern. Either for the life of the other people or for their own personal life. And it shows that they are not seeking the glory of God. They have another motive. Number two, judging and condemning other people for doing what you also do. Even you do it in greater measure. It revealed that your personality is not consistent and you have a heart that doesn't have principle. It shows that you are not a consistent person and your heart is without principle. How can you be committing fornication and you are telling people and you are criticizing people for doing the same thing? How can you be doing greater things, greater sin, grievous sin, and you are criticizing other people for doing something wrong? It shows that you have you are not a consistent person and your heart is without principle. I don't know how people feel when you know that you are doing the same thing you are condemning other people. When you know that you are even worse than the people you are condemning. It shows that you have no principle. And you are not consistent. Number three. Judging others for great sin or minor fault without helping them through patient instruction and personal godly influence and example is unkind and uncharitable. When you judge another person either of great sin or of a minor fault but you are not ready to patiently instruct them and you are not ready to personally influence them with a godly example your judgment is unkind your judgment is uncharitable did you hear what I say now um, hello did you get what I'm saying now why do you want to judge the people you don't want to patiently instruct? Why do you want to judge the people you are not ready to live a life of godly influence in front of them and a life of righteous example? The only thing you just want to are interested in this, just judge them, condemn them. You are not ready to instruct them with patience. When you say this thing is wrong, are you ready to teach them what is right? Is somebody hearing me now? And be ready to instruct them with patience. Ah, bro, this thing is wrong. This is the right thing. This is how you should do. This is how you should do. And show the love of God by instructing him patiently and also modeling righteous life in front of him. But the only thing you want to do is judge him, condemn him, criticize him. That is unkind that is uncharitable did you get that beloved the last one for tonight look at Matthew chapter 7 verse 3 to 5 and why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye but consider it not the beam that is in thy own eye or how will thou say to thy brother let me pull out the moat out of thine eyes and behold a beam is in thy own eye verse 5 thou what hypocrite first cast out what the beam 
out of thy own eye. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Beloved, after examining yourself, after genuine repentance and transparent righteousness in your own life, that is when you are qualified to correct and cancel your fellow brother. Is that okay? Is that okay? After examining yourself, after genuine repentance and transparent righteousness in your own life. That is when you can correct and counsel thy fellow brother. That's what Jesus is saying. That's when your judgment can be sound. That's when your judgment can be righteous. That's when your judgment can be lawful. Now, tonight, I am convinced that it is a night of self-examination. It is not a night of looking outward. It is a night of looking inward. It is not a night to care about who do I condemn. It is a night to look at your life and say, Search me, O God. And know my heart today. Try me. And see if there be some evil way in me. The Bible says. Examine yourself. Whether you are still in the faith. Beloved. I want you to keep your focus upon your life tonight. Put yourself on this scale of the word of God. Where are we found wanting? Let God help you. Before you begin to talk about another person. Remove the beam of your eyes. So that you can see clearly to remove the moat in the eyes of your brother. Beloved, I want you to search yourself tonight. Let the Holy Ghost search you. Let's rise up for prayers. Search yourself tonight. Don't be pretentious. Don't be hypocritical. What are those things that are still in your own life? This is not the time to talk about another person. Talk about yourself. This is not the time to focus on that person. Focus on yourself. Let this time be a time of self-examination. A time of genuine repentance. A time of transparent righteousness. Lord, have mercy upon me. Search me, O God. Search me, O God. Search me, O God. Have mercy upon me. Whatever is still in my life, O oh Lord, expose it to me. The ones that you know, take a decision tonight to abandon them. I break away from the life of sin. I break away from the life of hypocrisy. I break away from the life of unrighteousness. I don't just want to be a critic that criticizes other people and yet I'm, I'm guilty of what, what I'm criticizing. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Don't pretend before the Lord. Be plain before him. Let him help you. Let him help you. Every area of weakness, every area of defect, everything you are still struggling with, 
talk about them before the Lord tonight. Let him make you whole. Let him heal you. Let him perfect his work in your life. Take advantage of tonight's teaching. And open yourself to the Lord. Oh Lord help me. Oh Lord have mercy upon me. I will not take your grace for granted. I will not take the truth for granted. Forgive me of con condemning other people when I'm also guilty of the same thing. Forgive me of criticizing others when I'm also guilty of doing the same thing. Forgive me of all self-deception. Forgive me of talking about other people when I'm also guilty of what I'm talking about. Receive the help of the Holy Spirit tonight.